everybody. Uh, I'm Umang. Uh, I'm a graduate student at the University of Cambridge and a research fellow at the Partnership on AI. This is great work done with uh, uh, great co-authors from lots of awesome institutions. Alice Shubham, Adrian, and Ankur on the first line are all present here today. So in the last couple years, we've seen a growth in the transparency literature. In particular, there are a lot of algorithms that claim that they can explain machine learning model outputs. Our goal was to study, are people actually using these algorithms? And if so, how are they using them and who are they using them for? So our approach to solving this problem was conducting 30 minute or two hour semi-structured interviews with over 50 individuals from 30 different corporations. Now when we started doing these interviews, we realized, realized that we'd need a shared language between all of these stakeholders uh, from these different companies. Some were data scientists, some were um, from civil societies, and some were academics. Um, so for all intents and purposes of this talk and our, for our paper, we define transparency as something that provides stakeholders with relevant information for how a model works and explainability as providing insights into a model's behavior for a particular data point. So this definition of explainability would be referred to as local interpretability as done in the previous talks. Example questions we asked included what types of explanations were you using, natural language explanations, feature importance explanations, sample importance, so on and so forth. Who's the audience of this explanation? Is it a research scientist, product manager, domain expert, et cetera, et cetera? And in, this is the question that we cared about most, but in what context have you actually deployed this explanation? Is it informing the development process? Is it being used as justification, as referred to in the last talk? Or is it being used to help domain experts, uh, as referred to two talks ago? So we found that there were three types of explanation techniques that were popular amongst the organizations we interviewed. Feature importance explanations, which we've heard plenty about, providing attribution for which feature was most important for a given input sample. Sample importance, which has in recent years become very popular. This answers the question, which trading data, data point was very important for a given uh, new test point? And the third one, which we heard uh, quite wonderfully about a few talks ago, counterfactual explanations, uh, which asked the question, what do you need to change about this given input in order to change the predicted outcome? Now the stakeholders that we found uh, to be very relevant in the organizations that we interviewed included executives. Now we had a couple people tell us that um, the only reason that they were working on explainability in their organization was because their executives had come down and told their engineering teams that they needed to claim that they were using explainability in their products. We had a lot of engineers that uh, had, had read a lot about uh, explainability in, through the data science blogs and from our community's work, and they decided to start using these algorithms independently. We have end users uh, who obviously are motivated at the start of every single one of our papers, saying an end user really needs to know the explanation from the machine learning model outcome because, you know what, we're going to deny their loan. Um, and they need to know why we did that. Uh, so they're a relevant stakeholder at play here. And then we have regulators who uh, are hoping to, in some cases, use these explanations as a, some sort of legal justification for why a machine learning model out, outcome was made in the way it was. So our findings were threefold. We found that explainability is primarily used for internal debugging. The goals of explainability are not clearly defined within organizations, and there are inherent technical limitations to the current um, explainability work that has been done through our communities and in the broader uh, ML world. So we'll jump into each of these uh, quite briefly. So explainability being used for debugging internally, we found that the use cases and the example use cases that we, uh, that we got from our organizations uh, were mostly in finance and healthcare. Now when we say finance and healthcare, this doesn't mean that they were actually deployed. There were pilots being run in the financial industry and in healthcare, not necessarily being shown to doctors or to loan analysts themselves. The primary consumer of the explanation technique was ex almost exclusively a machine learning engineer. It was never seeing the light of day for an end user. Um, and even the, why am I seeing this tool, or why am I seeing this feature in some recommendation system algorithms, was not actually using any of the algorithms that our community has developed. And there's no actual consensus on how to evaluate these feature importance explanations. Um, there were some metrics that have been proposed uh, earlier in, in, in earlier in the talks that were given today and in, in some of the other literature, but there's no consensus on how to uh, actually measure and uh, convey fidelity and sensitivity to end users. 
One interesting thing we found is that the most popular explanation technique was feature importance explanations. Um, and the Shapley value framework was only really used because of its convenience. Um, it has an incredibly great Git repository that Scott put together. However, uh, its axiomatic guarantees that our community has enjoyed all break down when we start running approximations. So there's no reason why we ought to be using this framework. So one of the other findings we had was that the goals of explainability aren't clearly defined within organizations. So we attempted to create a framework for establishing explainability goals within an organization. We say first identify the stakeholder who's going to be consuming this explanation. Do they really even need an explanation? And um, once you identify the stakeholders, you can engage with them to figure out why they, what is it they really want from the model. Do they really just need to scrutinize the training data? Do they really just need to have some guarantees on the predictability or the reliability of the algorithm, which is not necessarily given by an explanation? So really understanding and taking time to understand what the purpose of the explanation is, is, is relevant. And then devising a workflow to figure out how this explanation will be used in practice. Uh, is it being used as a one-off justification, or is it being used to interact with the machine learning model and make updates to it, which is a great desiderata, but not being done at the moment. And the last thing we find is that there are technical limitations with the current algorithms that are proposed. We'll jump into those. In particular, a lot of the current techniques uh, detect spurious correlations in the, uh, the training data. So in particular, we were talking with one of our organizations, they built a smile detection algorithm, and they noticed that not only was the mouth important, but the high cheekbone was very important as well, and their uh, machine learning engineers really didn't know how to fix the problem other than trying to collect a lot more data that would that nullify this confounder, which talks about a broader problem, which was referred to in the last talk, that there are no causal underpinnings to the models themselves, and yet we're trying to develop causal attribution techniques. Um, not really sure how that would work, um, but um, there, there are, uh, there's a plethora of literature that, that is making an attempt to uh, develop causal attribution techniques, but we ought to be thinking about developing causal models themselves. Um, the other uh, interesting thing that we learned was that sample importance is, uh, has, is motivated very well in the literature. However, it's computationally infeasible to deploy at scale. The influence function work and some recent uh, work with Fisher kernels has been, uh, is, is really great in, in terms of figuring out how to, figure, how to get the most important training samples for a given test point. However, it's really hard to deploy even though a lot of, our a lot of the organizations we spoke with want to deploy these algorithms. We also see that some of the civil societies we spoke with do have privacy concerns that if I were to give you access to gradient, simple gradient-based explanations, I could reconstruct your training data, which could lead to model inversion. Uh, there is work done by people in this community around this, um, but this is something that had come up in some of the interviews we had. So all in all, here were our three findings. Explainability is primarily used for debugging. The goals of explainability are not clearly defined within organizations, and there are inherent technical limitations to making explainability um, useful. So we suggest everybody uh, in this room really cast doubt on those that are claiming to use explainability techniques and work with stakeholders to really understand what is the purpose of this explanation? Do we really need it? And if so, how can I, what algorithms can I develop to help my stakeholders get the explanations they need? If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, our paper is uh, available online. Thank you.